You know, we've already learned that the Ottoman Empire was a massive empire that covered up so much territory that it enclosed many, many different religious and ethnic groups. Many groups that coexisted for the most part for hundreds of years. And in fact, to help illustrate this, um, I want to think of an analogy here. And for me, when I think of the Ottoman Empire, I think of a big old plate, a big plate that can hold lots and lots of things. And in fact, the Ottoman Empire was able to contain many, many different religious groups and many different ethnic groups that all coexisted for hundreds of years. Just a sampling of some of the religious groups in the Ottoman Empire included Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims, Jews, Orthodox Christians, Maronite Christians, Yazidis, Catholics, and Druze. All these religious groups getting along just fine in the Ottoman Empire. But the Ottoman Empire also enclosed many, many different ethnic groups as well. The largest, of course, being the Arabs, but also we, you have a large number of Turks, Persians, Kurds, Armenians, and many more. All coexisting for hundreds of years. As you know, the Ottoman Empire, it ended. And the Ottoman Empire ended because of World War I. They got involved in World War I and unfortunately, unfortunately chose the wrong side. And uh, as a result, um, under the old rules of war, the loser has to give up their land to the winners. And this empire where everyone was getting along just fine, well, it got broken up. And while there was a conference that technically decided what was going to happen to the Ottoman land, their fate was really sealed by two guys. Two men from Britain and France, Marc Sykes and Francois Picot. Uh, over a dinner table uh, in Paris in 1917, pretty much decided exactly how the Ottoman Empire was going to be divided, not based on what was good for any of those ethnic groups, but what was good for Britain and France. So while we don't know the actual conversation, we know it went something like this. Marc Sykes says to Francois Picot, you know, we really would like on behalf of the, of the British, we would like this one piece of land over here that is next to Egypt to help protect our boundary with Egypt and the Suez Canal. And the French said, wait, oui, wait, oui, you can have that piece of land. Okay? And the French said, you know, we have this relationship with uh, greater Syria. We would like that piece of land. And the, and the British says, oh, jolly good chap, you can have that. Okay? Oh, and, uh, you know, we promised this... Uh, you know, by the way, friends, we, we promised this the land of Arabia to the uh, Sheriff Sharif of Mecca. Uh, we were going to give that to them. And the French, oh, sure, you can have that part. Okay. And uh, let's not forget about the, let's, let's not forget about Persia. We should leave Persia intact. Oh, sure, we can leave that over there. Um, oh, and um, while we're at it, why don't we create, go ahead and create a piece of land over here, and a piece of land over here, and a piece of land over here. As you can rightly imagine, um, the Ottoman Empire, especially the Arab land there, was never the same again. As you know, and you can probably hear, uh, this plate is definitely not intact. Boy, that's, uh, that's a lot of pieces. That's a lot of pieces, a lot of sharp pieces and there's no way that we can ever put this back together again. So let's talk about what happens to all of these pieces of the Ottoman Empire. So we'll discuss a few of the, uh, well, some of the selected pieces. So what we get here are a bunch of brand new borders. Brand new borders for countries that for the most part did not exist before. Now in a couple of cases we have countries that were very similar. Um, for a long time the Persians existed as a country of their own and so Persia was one of those parts that splits off. Uh, that is, Persia is one of those places that is created uh, at the end of the Ottoman Empire. It later becomes named Iran. What's left for the Turks 
what's left of Turkish land um, is allowed to become the nation of Turkey. The rest of this, though, is completely invented nations. Now, remember how the British Remember how the British wanted this one piece of land for themselves uh, next to Egypt? Well, that becomes the land of Palestine, or the British protectorate of Palestine. Protectorate's a fancy word for colony. Um, and the French uh, took over a piece of land, carved out this piece of land, and uh, named it uh, after the old Assyrian Empire and called it Syria. Uh, next to Palestine becomes a, the nation of Transjordan. Um, and in an interesting twist, um, the British had promised Arabia to uh, a particular Arab leader. They were going to create one big Arab state. Well, already pieces of that Arab state has been uh, broken apart. And uh, before that leader is able to be given the territory by the British, um, Ibn al-Saud of the Saud family takes over that land and renames it Saudi Arabia. We have another little piece over here that becomes Kuwait and many, many other pieces. But the British have a problem. The British have a problem. They promised Arabia, they promised Arabia to the Arabs and to the, uh, and to the Sharif of Mecca. Um, they still owe him. They still owe him. So the British created a piece of land. They created a country um, out of a land that involves Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and Kurds, and invented the state of Iraq to give to uh, this leader's sons. And so uh, what we end up with here is a bunch of artificial countries that didn't exist before. Artificial countries that unfortunately are going to find themselves very much in conflict. This map, this becomes the new map of the Middle East, and this becomes a recipe for years and years of conflict.